All right, guys. So here's a big one. Um, Stid expansion. Um, and because it's so big, because it talks about literally every place on the planet that Europeans expand into. So let's get into this. We start with our four pages of vocab. All right, I'm going to the next slide. Next slide. And final slide. I kind of, I missed Monroe Doctrine in there somewhere, but it's, it's done in the order of the back of the chapter. All right, let's go. This little hair thing has been so uncooperative today. Uh, you ask my seniors, you'll, you'll probably hear all Jennings talks about is his hair in the videos. Um, okay, so very dense chapter, is it? Yeah. Um, first, we start with imperialism in Africa. So one of the important things about why Africa gets settled during this point, but not during the period of European colonialism in unit three and four mainly is Africa is like massive. Um, you had pre-existing states in Africa that, for example, specifically had an inoculation to smallpox. So that didn't present the opportunity for expansion that indigenous, indigenous Americans offered um, to Europeans when they contacted them, right? Because Africa and America are in contact with, Europe around the for the same amount of time, right? And I think the smallpox thing is probably something that's playing a big role in it because the pre-existing states that the existing states that live in Africa offered a means to of resistance, not like they were actively resist, and maybe the Europeans could eventually have success in conquering them, but it just wasn't worth it, right? Now, kind of an interesting kind of intersection here is by near the beginning of this unit from 1750 to about 1810 the process of slavery of abolition is beginning in europe specifically the outlawing of the um african slave trade and i think if you remember when we talked about this in unit four a lot of african states ascended on depending upon african slaves the african slave trade for revenue and support right so these states become immensely wealthy off the trade of slaves and all of a sudden demand plummets during the abolition movement, which means that a lot of African states that were dependent upon the slave trade for their own strength no longer have that strength. And a lot of them collapse, which creates a power vacuum that Europeans are now prepared to access, right? The other in instance would be that um, the coastal parts of Africa are chill to like for, for Europeans, but getting interior to Africa, you have, first of all, the Sahara Desert that dominates the about a third of the continent in the north. Then you have the rainforest of sub-Saharan Africa, an equatorial Africa that have a lot of tropical diseases in there and stuff like that. Um, and then you also have the, all these states, right? Um, and then the raw materials that Africa has become even more desirable when and European states industrialize, their populations grow, and demand for all things increases, and Africa presents an opportunity to expand into. So um, I just talked about the interior with the rainforest and the deserts and things like that. Um, cuning, uh, which is a actually a key ingredient in tonic water, uh, offers a means. It doesn't treat it. It like offers a resistance to tropical diseases such as malaria. And my favorite thing to talk about, I'll probably talk about it in another video, one of the videos I did in 2021 during the pandemic school year, uh, that like uh, often people would take their cunin ration within a cocktail, which would be a gin and tonic. And that's why that's a cocktail that's even persists today, though no one's drinking gin and tonics to fight malaria, I think. Um, so... Uh, the next thing where British, the British are focusing on in North Africa would be Egypt. Um, and, and there's a specific part of Egypt that's of great interest to Great Britain because as India becomes a more and more important colony to Great Britain, uh, g accelerating and increasing access to the goods of India becomes more important. So uh, finding a way to get goods from India to Great Britain faster is of a chief interest to the British. And so... Um, Egypt has a very thin strip of land that connects like Africa, the African continent to the Middle East. And that's called the Sinai Peninsula. And a very tiny strip of land 
they build a canal through that strip of land and they call that the Suez Canal. And that Suez Canal links the Red Sea, which empties out into the Indian Ocean, into the to the Mediterranean Sea that empties into the Atlantic, right? So instead of having to go all the way around Africa, they now can just go through the Suez all the way around into the Mediterranean into Great Britain. Um, and wouldn't you know, um, the way that this was done, because it's a massive project to build a canal of the scale and size that the Suez Canal is, uh, the British usually used uh, a, a labor system known as corvée labor, which is a consistent type of labor used throughout imperialism. It's not slavery, but it is coerced. Uh, people are off are taken to as a form of taxation. So instead of like necessarily paying a fee for your taxes, you would be required to work for a period of time, like the Inca Mita you guys learned about in the beginning of the year, right? So that corvée system was used not only by the British, but also by many other imperial nations during this period. Um, the French also colonized a bunch of areas of West Africa, the separate colonies of Sierra Leone, Lagos, Gambia, Gold Coast. Um, in these periods of expansion, they often use diplomacy, but because the big issue with imperialism and industrialization is that they enable each other so as a nation becomes industrial it its economy grows in scale increasingly which need which increases the demand to access more raw materials and more markets and so states are driven to find more raw materials and markets to then enable greater ex industrialization which then enables expansion even more so most of these regions like in west africa they start by having these diplomatic arrangements with the british but eventually demand in britain for the goods produced the raw materials produced in in west africa becomes so that these are no longer equitable agreements, right? So the initial agreements are agreements made between African states and the British, and they were perceived to be mutual, mutually beneficial for the people who signed those treaties. But to a certain point, the British needed more than what the Africans are willing to give. Therefore, most of, the, most of the time, the British turned to military means to conquer these regions to then maximize what they could extract from them because dipl diplomacy was no longer beneficial to British interests. Um, in Africa, for the French, uh, they settle Algeria, which was an area that was like nominally under Ottoman control, but not like directly under Ottoman control. They take it over in the 1830s. Um, Algeria's proximity to France, it's really just like directly south of France through the Mediterranean, lead to a development of a pretty large settler settler population. They're called the Pied Noir or the Blackfeet. Um, you'll learn about them if you if you take IB history in, in a year, in two years. And um, the so and then and Algeria is the only real settler colony that the French ever develop. And uh, they want cotton, they want it, they grow wine, they also eventually find oil in Sahara and all that's really valuable to them. They also do very similar things to the French in Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, or Ivory Coast, and Niger, um, which is in the Niger River Delta and things like that. So that is the imperialism in Africa. That's annoying. So I think this is a two-parter. So this will probably be the last two slides of the video because you can already tell how long this is going to go. So Africa is now available for conquest. Uh, what that means is that all these European states, they want as much as they can get from Africa, which is going to escalate conflict between all the European states. But conflict between European states is becoming a thing that's be is pretty problematic because industrial states now have the means to fight wars in a way that are devastating to um, to populations, right? Because the kind of weapons they have now can just kill way more people. So War is incredibly expensive. When when industrial states fight wars, and this and this persists to, to this day, uh, they are far far more de deadly. Um, and so, war between industrial states is something that most industrial states do not prefer. Which leads to the Berlin Conference in the 1870s, where Otto von Bismarck gets all of the European states together, and instead of fighting among each other through war to determine who gets what part of Africa. They come to an agreement over who gets what part of Africa diplomatically so that everyone can in concert fight the African people 
to get what they want, right? And they and that makes it a more beneficial arrangement for Europeans, right? That they wouldn't have agreed to break up and split up Africa like this unless they thought that military conflict was to their good gain and none of them did because of industrial warfare. Now, the important thing about this is that if you ever looked at a map of Africa, you probably have noticed that there are a lot more straight lines that define the border of African nations than in a lot of other places of the world. And that's because these those lines are straight because they were drawn literally on a map, not starting here, but strongly influenced by the Berlin Conference. So these lines that are drawn were defined by European economic interests, European cultural claims, what European states thought they could get away with, not with like who lived there, right? So some of these lines are drawing, drawing, splitting this tribal groups into two different places, right? That like someone who lives in Mozambique in one tribe might also have relatives who live in what is modern day Zimbabwe. I think those countries border each other. It's just kind of the whole problem, isn't it? Um, that, uh, but that's because the lines weren't drawn to keep tribes together. It was because like those were the ways they divided the interests. Um, in South Africa, it's kind of a very interesting, kind of more complicated situation. The Dutch arrive and have a settler colony in in South Africa before the British come. But as the British become more and more powerful, they're able to eventually push the Dutch state out of there. But the settlers living there don't want to leave. So that leads to um, these three competing populations in South Africa. You have the British, who are kind of settling and developing their interest there. Afrikaners, who are people of Dutch ancestry who live there. And then you have Black Africans living there too, right? And so all of these competing groups lead to increasing conflict among them, right? So the British, they want to maximize their control of the colony that they have conquered. The people living there don't want to be exploited by the British, but also they are weaker than the British in a lot of ways. So they get pushed around. When they're pushed around, they come into contact with black African tribes that have been living there for like, you know, forever. And so the Afrikaners fight wars with the black Africans, one of the primary groups being the Zulu people. The British fight war uh, the wars with the the Afrikaners and the black Africans to continue to expand as well. And the black Africans also are like, are like what are y'all doing here? They fight a war against the two of them as well, right? Um, and so those are known as the Boer Wars. And um, in general, the Afrikaners are able to fight a pretty effective war, guerrilla war against the British, where they like can frustrate the occupation. They engage in hit and run tactics. They don't really fight any formal battles against the British. They fight a lot of small battles. And they have the support of the native populace, the white native populace, because they're all Dutch people too. So eventually the British resort to a policy of con using concentration camps where they move, they forcibly migrate populations, both the Afrikaners and black Africans into these single places so that they can be monitored and controlled. And I wouldn't, would you, wouldn't you be surprised if uh, the white camps got treated okay-ish and the black camps got neglected? And kind of a really important thing to talk about with South Africa as a small tangent, I promise, is that the Afrikaners' ability to effectively resist the British in this moment gave the Afrikaners a kind of leverage in, a, in the politics of South Africa. And what that meant is that as Africa gets more and more autonomy um, throughout the 20th century, this white minority is appropriated a disproportionate amount of political power that eventually leads to the institution of apartheid or a type of it, uh, segregation or, or pretty extreme segregation comparable to the American South, but even more extreme called apartheid that you'll learn about in the um, succeeding chapters here. So uh, the final slide we're going to look at for this part one of this uh, 6.2 video would be the Congo. So Belgium is a country that comes out of the Napoleonic Wars and the Congress of Vienna. Um, it's a tiny country that's late to the party. It doesn't have a lot of colonies. Um, and the only place left in Africa that's available is Sub-Saharan Equatorial Africa. So there's a pretty, pretty big river called the Congo River. Um, and it's pretty much unexplored by Europeans. People don't know where it ends, where it goes. There's a theory that the Congo River is actually connected to the Nile River. That is not true. But there are, you know, geographically, they're relatively close. But Africa is a massive continent, right? So 
the Belgium, the Belgian leader, his name is King Leopold. I got to bolt him. Um, he sees the Congo as the only place where he can really like make a colony that can be lucrative for Belgium and lucrative for himself. And so he's able to kind of finagle things. The Berlin conference, he gets everyone to kind of guarantee that the Congo is Belgium's. And he founds a, a, a thing. I don't want to call it a country called the Congo free state. Um, he kind of says it's one thing and it's very clearly not one that thing, right? These people who, these Africans who are living on the Congo river do not really have a lot of interaction with, with Europeans. And what this leads to is the Belgians and the people who work for Belgium really exploiting and manipulating in a lot of ways, like this was not Belgium's colony. This was Leopold's colony. Uh, and Leopold was personally being enriched by the exploitation of these people. Um, they use slave labor, like they, they would like capture the wives of men and say, you have to work and get this much rubber every day, or we will like kill your wife. And they literally would do that. Uh, if you didn't, if you, they would have children work, if, if people didn't harvest enough rubber and within a quota, within a certain amount of time, they would remove their hands. Um, you just have like massacres of people. You have the Congo people are like resisting this actively too. And actually no one in Europe knows this is happening. They just think that like, the, the, it's called the Congo Free State because the idea is that like these, it's all these like tiny little states that live on the Congo River that are being supervised by Belgium, um, but in fact they're being actively oppressed by Belgium. And, and until like certain people like like snuck into the Congo Free State and like saw what was happening and like revealed it to the world, no one knew it was happening. Um, and the reason why I wouldn't call it a free state is because um, it didn't behave like a government. Its purpose was to maximize profit. Uh, mainly in ivory and rubber production, um, which means that it didn't have the relationship of the consent of the governed at all at any point. And you'll notice that about a few of these places, especially where like companies exist, where there's no obligation to actually uh, service the needs of these subject peoples, like in in Southeast Asia, in Africa, that these places are not for those people to like be protected. They're actually to be exploited by the European states. And then our two independent countries would be Abyssinia, otherwise known as Ethiopia. And they're able to effectively maintain their independence because they're able to appeal to the interests of other European states that would benefit from their independence. So like, for example, Italy is a new country. It's late to the game. It tries to conquer Ethiopia, but Ethiopia is able to like kind of persuade Britain, like, hey, you don't want a strong uh, Italy because Italy controls, has a lot of influence in the Mediterranean Sea, and you need to have like dominance in the Mediterranean Sea in order to move your stuff from the Suez Canal into the Atlantic. So you want a weak Italy, and Britain's like, hmm, I want a weak Italy. And so they, they give the Ethiopians arms and protection to fight against the Italians. Liberia is like a weird country that is populated first with freed American slaves, but also there's like indigenous Africans living there too, and like that's a messy situation but the whole impetus for liberia is like partially like racist in that like a lot of a lot of white americans believe that the best thing to do after slaves were freed after the civil war would be to send all black people back to africa um which is like kind of an ick because those people are americans too and then also though some african americans believed that yeah, I want to go back to this place that I was I was abducted from. Like I feel a lineage and a heritage to that. So they so some some people went to Liberia because they wanted to like connect back to their African ancestry. Some people felt compelled to, or the funding to send people to Africa came from like racist white people who wanted to get rid of all black people in America. So we're gonna pause here and continue on in the next part two. I, I hope we can do this in two parts today.